Over the centuries, Ulster Scots folk have garnered a reputation for piety and politics with strongly held beliefs and great traditions. But what we're less well known for is our culture of storytelling and love of a good yarn, often passed down through the generations. Many of these stories were told to pass a dark night around the fireside, tales kept for when the wains had gone to bed. I'm Darren Gibson, writer and Ulster Scot, and there's nothing I like more than a yarn about ghosts. And I'm David Hume, author and Ulster Scots historian. I'm equally fascinated by these stories. David and I share an obsession in trying to find the truth behind these folk tales. What can these families tell us about the story of the White Lady? From historic castles. There's a legend about this picture, isn't there? There is indeed, yeah. To dark cellars. Well, he believed that there was tunnels, actually, that ran onto the house. Lonely roads. This road is supposed to be the most haunted road in Northern Ireland. And abandoned graveyards. And that was the dare to come in here at Halloween at midnight and to stand in here for one minute inside this uh, enclosure. Come along with us as we try to uncover the truth behind the stories told to make a body a feared. For almost four centuries, Ballygally Castle has stood on the Antrim coastline. Its windows gazing over the Irish Sea towards Scotland's nearby shore. Built in the year 1625 by Scottish settlers, these stone walls played a vital role in protecting the local Ulster Scots community during the rebellion of 1641. But today, it is a luxury hotel, so you'd think it would be more peaceful. And yet, guests sometimes find it hard to sleep. Speaking of a forlorn and ghostly female figure, crying and knocking on bedroom doors. They say her ghost walks the halls of this place. They say she wails. People have talked about seeing a presence at the end of their beds. Legend has it, that this is the tormented soul of a woman who lived and also died tragically here almost 400 years ago. So what secrets does this castle still hold? And what truths lie undiscovered in these towers of stone? Among the first wave of settlers from Scotland to Ulster in the early 17th century was James Shaw, a descendant of the Lords of Greenock, and he built this castle as a family home. This wave of settlement was at the very dawn of the Ulster Scots, and it was just before the official plantation of Ulster, when confiscated lands were used by the Crown to bring over English and Scottish families in an effort to make Ulster a more settled place. Many of those families, like the Shaws, were Presbyterians. Unlike most Scottish settlers who came over to work small patches of land as tenants, James Shaw was a landlord with wealth and privilege. The experience of these settlers has often been reimagined in songs and stories, and powerfully so by one of Ulster's most famous 20th century poets. John Hewitt encapsulates the displacement of the Scottish settlers in his poem, Once Alien Here. Once alien here, my fathers built their house, claimed, drained, and gave the land the shape of use, and for their urgent labor grudged no more than shuffled pennies from a hoarded store. The ghost that's said to haunt this castle is none other than James Shaw's wife, Isabella. 
Legend suggests that she was imprisoned in the tower here for months, maybe years before her death. So what do we know about Lady Isabella Shaw? On the face of things, it would first appear that she was every bit James's equal. Lady Isabella comes from a, quite a prosperous family, the Brisbane family. She married James Shaw, and this house is almost a joint enterprise in terms of the building, because if you look at the plaque uh, on the wall, it has both their initials. So it's a, very much a, a, an enterprise of the two of them to build this castle together. James and Isabella were effectively a 17th century power couple. On arrival here, they were granted land by the Crown on which they built their castle. It was heavily fortified for protection and strategically placed for easy access across the sea back to Scotland. Originally, these walls would have run all the way down to the shore and the fresh water stream within the grounds supplied crucial drinking water for those inside, which was especially vital if the castle was to fall under siege. This is a very unusual building for this part of the world. I mean, we usually see these corbel turrets over the Irish Sea in Scotland, but here we have it on the coast of Ulster. It's a defensive building, um, and these turrets are now more decorative, but they originally would have been defensive. Uh, windows would have been quite small, partly because it's easier to, to fire muskets out of windows and people can't uh, get a clear view of you when you're doing that. The Scots settlement in Antrim and Down came ahead of the official Ulster Plantation of 1609, and it saw many families from the west coast of Scotland find a new home in Ulster. Although the Scots came to Ulster in large numbers, it was the English who had the real power here. Ulster had long been considered the most Gaelic and most rebellious of Ireland's provinces. The plantation was a royal settlement scheme to pacify the region. It was felt that bringing more British, Protestant settlers into Ulster would make it much easier to govern. And this was the context in which the Shaws built their castle in 1625. Made worse by political turmoil in England and Scotland, the tensions in Ireland exploded into a bloody rebellion in 1641. The native Irish resisted and resented the authority of the English over them and were spurred on by fear of a clampdown on their Catholic faith. How did the 1641 rebellion unfold? Well, it unfolded in that it was uh, essentially a rebellion against the authorities. Um, it was an Irish rebellion. The original instructions were that um, they were not to uh, interfere with the Scots settlements. There was a genuine concern for the rebels that if they were to attack the Scots, then an army would be sent across the narrow sea from Scotland to defend them. However, in the chaos, centralised command disintegrated and there were massacres on all sides. This is why James and Isabella decided to open the doors of Ballygally Castle as a refuge for the local Ulster Scots population. So we do know that even uh, so close to the Scottish coast, uh, there, was, there was a real and uh, present threat effectively there uh, for the Shaws and for the, the people in the farms around. This was a dark time in Ulster's history. And incredibly, witness testimonies from the time survive to this day, which describe the kind of violence Isabella and James wanted to protect people from. These first-hand depositions give a vivid account of what Protestants and Catholics from all social backgrounds experienced during the rebellion. So we'll have a, a deposition here from a John Jameson, uh, who was in Ballygally at the time of the, the, the rising. And he tells us that he sent his, his children, Robert and Henry, with their sister uh, to a barn about three quarters of a mile to fetch some corn for their subsistence. They were set upon by six horsemen pursu who pursued after his children and overtook Henry and Isabel. He heard by the report of the country that his son Henry was hanged afterwards over the bridge of Glenarm by the McGills. These sound like particularly 
brutal murders. I mean, this is children that we're talking about. In this, in this case, yes, it is, yes. Um, I mean, what happened to the daughter in this story? We get her examination, 17th of May, 1653, Isabel Jameson, so she, we know she survives. She talks about being carried to Glenarm to one John Oak's house. She saw uh, Brian O'Mulligan pursue hard after her brother Robert, who escaped through a river, um, so he got away. But she did say then a young boy, William Hunter, uh, was carried also with her and her brother to Glenarm, and she heard it said that they had drowned the said boy and kept him underwater with pikes till he died. So she obviously knows who they are, uh, otherwise she wouldn't be able to name them in this way. Um, so you get a sense really that this is, this is very, very uh, personalised conflict here. She can't read or write. She signs her deposition by making an X. Sometimes uh, history is not recorded for people like her. They're just the ordinary people who get caught up in the midst of it all. It is fascinating to read first-hand accounts of people who were actually taking refuge in the castle at that time. People who could have interacted with James and Isabella and no doubt been very grateful for their help and for their kindness. But after surviving the rebellion together, did relations between James and Isabella then deteriorate to the point where she became his prisoner? The actual room where Isabella is said to have been imprisoned has been kept intact, so visitors can learn about her story. Local storyteller Liz Weir has long been fascinated by this tale, and according to her, there's more than one version of what may have happened to Isabella in this room. Like many a rich man, Sir James wanted an heir to inherit his estates, and Isabella fell pregnant, but the story goes that she delivered a baby girl instead of the son he was expecting. The child was taken from Isabella and that she was locked up here in this high tower room. They say that Isabella threw herself out of this tower room. And then the other version is that perhaps she was thrown out from it. And she's still here, according to the ghost story. They say her ghost walks the halls of this place they say she wails, she knocks. People have talked about seeing a presence at the end of their beds. And certainly in this small room, you can imagine what it'd be like, shut up here, missing your child, broken hearted. That's why her spirit is restless and still walks the corridors of this wonderful place. So that's the story as we know it. This is kind of like a fairy tale in reverse. I mean, it's a tale of isolation, of desperation, and one with a particularly gruesome ending. Darren, I think you're right. This is more of a nightmare than a fairy tale. If the story is true, I wonder how Isabella must have felt, torn from her child, scared, isolated, and alone. Such feelings of deep unease and despair are beautifully evoked in James Fenton's poem, A Neighbor Woman. Back again, lo, be the merch thorn hedge, among the drucket corn, hanging with a wacht of seed, an endless rain, belly hell in the grup o oh, hugging arms. She saw again, where a week go the quick brecht in, why it wasn't I, again, and waked back, howling to the hoose up thoner. Stunning, white and solid, again the hanging sky, solid as stain. The door shut, ticked, again the battering o' the rain, the wonders blend. Now the hotel's boardroom, the 1625 room within the castle, would have been a grand drawing room for the Shaws when they lived here together all those centuries ago. So is this about property and prestige, or is this about inheritance in the family name? Well, it's a bit of both, really. Um, I suppose being good Scots, property comes high up that list. And if you think about the construct of the ghost story about Lady Isabella, it is, it is constructed around the issue of inheritance. The issue of inheritance loomed large for the Scots who settled here because they were newcomers to this area. And for someone like James Shaw, the birth of a male heir would have been very important in order to secure the family name and estate for generations to follow. 
This was not far away from the west coast of Scotland, but it was a, a world away in some ways. So they wanted to settle and establish themselves here. Um, and it was about putting down roots. It was about uh, making sure that into the future, this was going to be the settlement that was going to be here. And in order to make sure it succeeded, then you've got to have people coming down the line after you. It's vital to our investigation that we find some evidence of what, if any children, James and Isabella really had together. David, have you been able to find out anything about the Shaw's daughter? Well, I've got a, a document here which is really interesting. It's from um, 1659. It, it's a sort of an amateur census, but also it does have details of who the main landowners are effectively, oh. so you get them as well. Now, first thing to say then is that it is unlikely you're going to find many female names in the list because they're not landowners. But when we look at the area here, uh, County Antrim, and you, you look down at um, Ballygally, you have James Shaw Esquire and John Shaw Esquire, his son. Wait, there's a son? Yes, that's the big shock reveal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> After all we've been told at Ballygally Castle, we now hear that he has a son. Yes, that... Okay, that... this changes everything, David. This document throws everything we thought we knew about this story up in the air. If Isabella did give birth to a son, then why would James punish her? Well, I suppose the first thing is that she wasn't locked in the tower because she didn't produce a son. We know that now. We can at least be sure of one thing. Isabella was at a disadvantage just for being a woman. And if her husband wanted to lock her in the tower for any reason, then he could do so. So in terms of what people believed and what, what they were instructed, um, the, the Calvinist faith really um, had the view that the woman had a position in society. Uh, it wasn't an equal position with men. Um, so that, that then meant the woman was in a subservient place. Of course, there are verses in the Bible, like uh, Ephesians 5 and 22, which teaches this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. And you've got to remember that the Bible is the centre of how people live their lives. It is the, the absolute marker for them. Uh, so it, it might appear very 17th century, but that is how they operated and what they believed. But would it have been this way for Isabella? I mean, she was rich. Well, it wouldn't have made any difference, really. Um, Isabella is a, a well-off, wealthy individual but she's still in that system, effectively. So therefore, that, that does mean that something could have happened, that uh, her husband wasn't happy with her for some reason, and she was confined to the tower. Since they first arrived on Ulster shores in the 17th century, Generations of Ulster Scots women have lived in traditional, largely patriarchal communities, meaning there was always plenty of material for anyone who liked to spin a shocking tale. Red Hall Estate in Ballycarry is said to be the home of one such tale, that of a woman whose spirit remains here, supposedly tethered to the scene of her final trauma. Well, this particular location is associated with a figure that appears, a figure of a lady called the White Lady. She appears to go along a similar route whenever there's a sighting. Uh, it's along the same general route. Indeed, this is a path that goes down to the Glenhead yeah. field where she's traditionally seen. In 1948, a young scout troop went out on a camping trip here, claimed to have seen a strange lady silently walking along and staring straight ahead. But other people have told me locally that they, they have seen strange things in the same area here, and they just didn't share it with, with too many people because they felt they wouldn't be believed. According to local tradition, this white lady is the spirit of a servant from centuries ago, who, after falling pregnant to her master, was murdered and buried along this path. In our experience, 
Ghost stories like this often have some basis in real history. So we want to see, if any, records remain that could tell us more about what women have lived here at Red Hall through the centuries. Red Hall was built by Sir William Edmonston of Duntray, Scotland, in 1609. And I am hoping to uncover clues in the family's own records that could unravel the mystery of the tragic White Lady. So this house has a real Ulster Scots lineage. Absolutely, very, very strongly so. But what can these families tell us about the story of the White Lady? Well, family stories can be quite instructive sometimes. Uh, so I've got a little nugget from an old newspaper, Darren, I'm going to share with you in relation to that. Ah, oh, fantastic. I've managed to dig out a copy of an article from the Larne Weekly Reporter in 1871. It's on the subject of longevity, and specifically on people from the local area who lived beyond 90 years of age. Close to the top here is uh, 1785, November the 2nd, Mrs. Anne Edmonston Redhall, 90, commonly called the Lady. From her, the Lady Hill near Ballycarry takes its name. The article goes on to say that Anne Edmonston's favorite walk was close to where the ghost is said to have been seen walking up and down. Could this be a clue about the origin of this tale of the White Lady? Perhaps this elderly lady on her dusk walks was enough to frighten a local child and spark a ghostly rumour. And what of the supposed murder of a young girl who worked here? We haven't found any evidence of this, but that's not to say that this folk memory is an imagined one. So this story about a servant girl, could that have really happened? Yes, it could have happened. Um, and it sort of speaks to the wider context about uh, female position in society as well. The servant girl uh, ends up murdered. So that's the extent of how powerless she is in the whole context of this story. This tale of a 19th century lady who loved to walk the woods seems to have become blended with an older memory of a mistreated servant, a story then shared around local firesides, growing with every telling into the chilling tale of the wandering white lady. Lady Isabella and the unknown servant girl are opposite ends of the social scale, but both their stories echo an age-old theme of women at the mercy of more powerful men. We already have the census record debunking the myth that there was no male heir in the Shaw family at Ballygally. But now even more evidence has come to light to help prove that this was far from the case. Look at the length of the family tree we have here. We're concerning ourselves with this little section here. We've got James or John Shaw, Bally Galley here. We've got Isabel Brisbane. Uh, we've got uh, Captain John Shaw. But that's not all. Uh, we've got um, James Brisbane, uh, who marries Elizabeth Brisbane, uh, his relative. So a second son? That's a second son, yes. And there's more. Then we have uh, William Shaw. A third son. <laughs> a third son. And by no means least, we have Jean Shaw. I mean, this turns the whole thing on its head. We can, we can no <laughs> yeah. longer believe the legend that we're being told. It stands on its head, the story Absolutely. about uh, Isabella and, and no male heir. Yeah, and an amazing bit of evidence. Well done. If Isabella really gave James three sons, not to mention her daughter, why does the ghost story present her as a victim? And what other reason might her husband have had to condemn her. David, what do you make about this whole tale of James Shaw locking Isabella in the tower? I mean, I'm dumbfounded about it. Well, it's an interesting story, Darren. Um, often there's an element of truth in these stories, and we should not forget that people told stories, uh, both to entertain and also to, to convey messages. Could the story that has developed around Isabella be an Ulster Scots example of a familiar trope in Scottish folklore, that of a woman in a castle, trapped and mistreated 
at the hands of a more powerful man. Many believe that the lamenting ghost of Lady Fanny Sinclair haunts the castle of May in Caithness. The story goes that she died in 1854 by throwing herself from a high window after the stable hand with whom she fell madly in love was banished by her father. Another is Isabel of Canard Head Castle in Aberdeenshire, who fell in love with a servant piper. Legend has it that her enraged father locked her in the tower and the piper in a cave beneath the castle, where he drowned at high tide. Isabel is said to have then thrown herself onto the rocks below. Now, some say that every time a storm is brewing, an eerie tune can be heard on the wind. Isabella Shaw's tragic story of falling to her death after being locked in the tower by an angry husband fits neatly into this folk tale tradition. Ghost room, if you dare, are you on the right way? Well, yes, it appears so. In this coastal hotel, the legend of Lady Isabella and her ghost is a great draw for visitors and makes for a fascinating and memorable overnight experience. So perhaps the most terrifying element of this story is not the ghost tale, but the hard truth that according to the laws of the 17th century, James Shaw would have had every right to imprison his wife and separate her from her child. A truth that feels very shocking today. Do you think the story of Lady Isabella falling to her death from this tower could still be real? even if it's not for the reasons we initially believed. We can't say for sure, but we have found enough out, I think, to, to sort of lead us to speculate that potentially there's a basis to this story, but it's not exactly perhaps as it's been uh, told down through the generations. James and Isabella played an important role in the protection of the local Ulster Scots community during the rebellion by giving them refuge within the castle walls. In the end, it was a Scottish army that turned the tide of the conflict and restored order to Ulster. David, this has been an absolutely fascinating story. I mean, there's yeah. so many things that we've uncovered here. Absolutely, and it just shows you that uh, you sometimes have to dig quite deep to get to the, the bottom of a story, but we've really found some fascinating things in terms of looking into the background of these stories. Although the significance of Ballygally in this conflict is irrefutable, the enduring interest in the castle is because of Lady Isabella Shaw. And for anyone curious enough to dig deeper, the part her family played in what happened here is fascinating. And even though there are still some unanswered questions about her story, Isabella's name is forever remembered in the oral tradition of storytelling and the timeless appeal of a cracking yarn told by the fireside to pass a dark night and mac a body afeard. As midnight came and Donald rose and through the gloom he wended, the moon was gone, the roof of wind wheeled like a babe untended. To last the old kirk door they broke and there a corpse they found him, cowl as the dead man's beans that lay in mouldering dust around him. <laughs> 